Uh, I'm going to be today in the book of Philemon, and as you're turning there, uh, I just wanted to, I, I got to have the privilege of meeting a few of you as you were coming in. Some of you I had uh, spent some time talked to uh, in various meetings that I've been a part of before, and some of you I haven't gotten to, to meet or speak with yet, and I look forward to doing that, but um, my name is uh, Carson, and my, uh, with me today I have uh, my wife, Kara, uh, her mom, my mother-in-law, Lisa, who is also here, and then uh, downstairs I have three uh, kids. I have a four-year-old son named Zayden, I have a three-year-old daughter named Willa Gray, and I have a one-year-old daughter named Goldie, and they are all downstairs, and so it is a, uh, it is a privilege to get to be here uh, with you uh, today. I drove out here for the first time, you know, uh, I, whenever that was a few weeks ago, and I, meant for many years, I don't know, uh, some of you may have known this, but I actually, my dad was the pastor uh, not far from here at a place called Heads Free Will Baptist Church, and so I actually grew up uh, until I was about 11 at Heads Free Will Baptist Church, and there is uh, some overlap, I think, with some people here. I think Brian's wife is related to some people that I know, um, to Marla and them, uh, what was her maiden name? Richardson. Okay, yeah. Is that you guys, Richardson? Okay, different Richardsons. Well, I, uh, I, I just thought, you know, what a cool kind of turn of events in my life that, you know, uh, w- when I was at Heads, my dad eventually took, a, uh, uh, took us to the mission field, and I spent much of my uh, middle school and high school years in Central Asia in the former Soviet Union, and, you know, you know, you go off to college, you get married, and, you know, then uh, this opportunity kind of comes along, and I'm, you know, it's kind of right back to some, some places where I, I grew up near uh, Heads Free Baptist Church, and so I thought, what a cool opportunity. I, I went to Cumberland Camp many years. Uh, actually, two years ago, I spoke at Cumberland Camp, which was a cool full circle uh, thing for me as well. So I just, I really do appreciate the opportunity to be here with you, um, with you today. And so I want to talk from the book of Philemon today, which is uh, perhaps not a book that's often uh, spoken about. A few years ago, I did a series at my uh, church in Arkansas on all the shortest books of the Bible uh, uh, because they were interesting. I was also in school full time, and so I didn't have a. I wanted to study smaller ones instead of bigger ones. And I realized uh, sometimes these smaller ones get overlooked, and I hadn't really heard it was on Philemon. And I thought, what a what an interesting thing uh, it would be to 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 look into this. And so this is something that had been um, on my heart for, for a while and something that I, I thought there were some uh, amazing things I wanted to, for us to discuss today. And so today I want to talk to you about four guides, four guides to gospel transformation from the book of Philemon. Four guides to gospel transformation from the book of, of Philemon. Uh, when I talk about the Bible or when I preach, uh, any time that I preach, uh, my goal is that you... Whatever I would say, you wouldn't have to just take at face value. You could look down and be like, yeah, I see that right there. And so I really want to uh, look at the text as well. And, and we, will read, uh, we will read this. And, and um, I want to give you first a little bit of background as to, to why. Uh, I, I guess I always think about this. And my pastor uh, helped me. He said, uh, it's interesting to think there's, uh, the Bible is not even really a book. It's a library of books. And out of all the things, all the books that could have made it in, into the final cut, why did, why did any of these 66 make the cut? They could have, there are a lot of other things written out there. Why did Philemon make the cut and some other things didn't make the cut? Why did this get included in the Bible uh, compared to other things? And I, I, I usually try to think about that if I'm preparing a sermon, especially on a book that's maybe not as uh, widely uh, talked about, doesn't get maybe as much attention as others. And, and, and so I like to think about that when I prepare and, and I speak. Uh, from a book, and so uh, when, I, when I think about the context of this book as we get into the passage, uh, it, it reminds me, on his, uh, on his journey, uh, uh, Sergeant Miller told me that they're in the book of Acts, and the book of Acts is, is, uh, talks a lot about the life of both Peter and Paul in the early church, and Paul is the guy who you may know all obviously started as Saul, a murderous kind of bloodthirsty Jewish zealot who, after a divine encounter with Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, uh, converts his life, uh, gives his life to Christ, eventually becomes a Christian missionary uh, and, and church planter, maybe the most successful ever. Uh, he has maybe the most books in, in the Bible, uh, so, so that's a, a good record that he holds. And uh, he, he, he converts his life, becomes a church planter, and w- one of his best buddies, 
Barnabas. Him and Barnabas are the first ever dynamic duo. They're a two-man church, and they just go around the world, and they start planting a bunch of churches. And they go to new places. They don't know anybody. They learn the language. They meet the people. They start a church. And once this church kind of gets set up and they get a little leadership, they move on to the next place and the next place. And Paul does this. uh, He has this one journey. They do a circuit. They make their way back home. And uh, him and Barnabas have planted a number of churches. He ends up doing this throughout his life three times. Uh, But this is the first time. If if we think about the first journey that he did planting these churches, one of the places he went to plant churches with his best buddy Barnabas, he went to a place called Colossae. Colossae has a book of the Bible written to it, uh, Colossians, the book of Colossians. And so he plants this church in um, Colossae, and they don't have the money or the wherewithal, or for whatever reason, they they don't have their own structure like we might have here. They meet in a guy's house. This is a house church. Really, most all of the early churches were house churches. They just meet in somebody's house. And they meet in the house of a wealthy businessman whose name is Philemon. And Philemon is a guy who uh, has a lot of resources at this time. He's a pretty wealthy guy. And And the whole church meets inside of his house. That is the hub of all, not only just the church, but there's not other Christians. There's no other denominations. That's the only Christians that exist in this area. And all of them, kind of hub, uh, the central hub of Christianity there in the area, is this guy's house. And this is the ancient world. It's a lot different than the world that we live in. Whenever I open the pages of the Bible, I always have to remind myself, we always have to go on two journeys. One journey is back in time thousands of years ago, and one journey is uh, all the way from here to the Middle East. And so when we read the Bible, don't forget that this happened a long time ago in a place that's a lot of miles away. And so remember that the things happening happen in that context. One of the difficulties about that context is that people in that time owned slaves. They had slaves. It was a common thing. It wasn't even It wasn't even like they did it with a dirty conscience. It was just part of the common day, and that is how it was. And so this guy Philemon, him and his house, which the slaves would have been a part of the people who run his house, who live there, they're all part of this Colossian church, and they are the central hub. So Paul goes on through his life. They've planted this church. Things are going fine. As the years go by, eventually Paul goes through a series of unfortunate events and ends up under house arrest in Rome. This is basically the the last years of Paul. And while he's in uh, Rome, he's under house arrest, basically waiting for his case to appeal to the Supreme Court kind of thing. Uh, And he's waiting to appeal his case before the emperor. But while he's doing that in house arrest, he has uh, essentially a ministry going kind of out of this house that he's renting. And guys come to him. He's kind of like the central hub, and people will come to him. So this guy named Epaphras, he's from Colossae, that place he planted a church in a long time ago that meets at Philemon's house. A guy from that church, from that city, from that town, comes to Paul, and he says, Paul, you know what? We're having, we're having some problems. The problems that we're having that we cannot resolve are that we've got a lot of false teaching. A lot of people who are taking the gospel that you preached originally, directly to us, and they're taking it, and they are saying all kind of wild things. They're not telling the truth, and we don't know how to fight that. So Paul goes, okay, this is great. I will actually write a, write a letter and try to resolve these issues, and that's the letter that we have in the Bible called Colossians. This issue is one that's fighting false doctrine, so like when you open it, what you're going to see is you're going to see theology in there. He actually does the same thing to the church in Ephesus uh, and the church in Philippi. And so he writes these letters, and these letters have a lot of theology in them. Of, uh, theology in them. And they have a lot of encouragement to hold to the faith that Paul taught them a long time ago. And so he writes these letters. Remember, there's no email, there's no fax. So how do letters get from Rome back to the churches they came from? Well, he has to send these letters with people. And so he chooses two people to send these letters. He has three letters. These are called the prison epistles. And he, he has to find some way to get them to these churches. And so he, give, he, he, he gives them to two guys. One guy's name is Tychicus. If you're, you know, if you're looking at having another kid, put that on your, your name list. It's possible. Tychicus. And another guy, the other guy in this duo of delivering letters, is a guy named Onesimus. And Onesimus and Tychicus are tasked with the job of taking these letters from Paul in his, under house arrest in Rome, and they've got to take them back to these churches that they have to deliver them to. But there's one problem. One of the two guys delivering the letters, Onesimus, there's a problem. 
he has to deliver a letter to Colossae, which is meeting in Philemon's house. And the problem is, when he walks onto the property, the issue is that Onesimus used to be one of Philemon's slaves. And he ran away. And people debate on whether or not he accidentally stumbled onto Paul in Rome or he intentionally sought Paul out in, in Rome. Uh, I don't know the answer. And honestly, it doesn't really matter which one it is. It just matters that he got there. And when he got to Rome, after he had left Philemon, he, uh, he, he ran away. He got to Rome, becomes a disciple of Christ, and Paul trains him up in the gospel and views him spiritually as a son. He is a mentor to Onesimus. He begins to love Onesimus as anyone would love their own flesh and blood. And so he knows that when he gives this letter to Onesimus and, and his buddy, and they walk into the church, uh, it's going to be an awkward sight. Because if you think about this, we, we don't have really a frame of reference since none of us are uh, slave owners. But in the law of the time, there's a philosopher named Aristotle you may have heard of. He was part of the ancient world that had the same view. He is known for having said, a slave is a living tool just as a tool is an inanimate slave. The, the slaves were not even viewed as human. And so if you were to be a runaway slave, it was viewed in the eyes of the law as self-theft, meaning you were stealing an asset from the owner. Legally, if Onesimus shows back up at Philemon's house, there is, under local law, there is legal recourse that Philemon could have taken against Onesimus and probably had him put to death because of it. This was no small matter. This just wasn't like awkward conflict that uh, one hard conversation would have resolved. Legally, Philemon had the opportunity, if he wanted to, if he sees Onesimus, boom, there is legal recourse against him for what he did by running away. That is how the laws of the time worked. So Paul writes a letter. At the very end, they're about to head out the door. He's like, hold on, I wrote this one extra thing. And when you get there, give this to them before you do anything else. Because it's going to be kind of an awkward confrontation. And so that's how we got the letter of Philemon. Now, what I, the reason I think Philemon, if you're asking yourself, how did this book, it's only, what, 20 verses? Uh, 25 verses, right? How did this book make the cut in the Holy Scriptures for all of time? Versus other things. Well, I think that a plausible explanation for this is that Paul has written a lot of books that contain a lot of theology. And those books are solid. They are systematic. They are interesting to study. They have guided us for many years. And Philemon is not one of them. Not that there's not important stuff in Philemon. Philemon is a practical book. Philemon is Paul's application of the theology that he taught and wrote about in other books applied to a real-world circumstance in Philemon. This is an object lesson. This is a case study for Paul's theology in action. And that is why I think Philemon has tremendous value, because we get to see Paul do the things and require the things of, uh, of his church people, of those that he has trained and discipled, that he has already taught about and written about in his other letters and books. And so that is why we even find it worth our time to study the book of Philemon is to see how the practical gospel principles transform us in our daily lives. And, and it doesn't matter if you look at this and say, I've never owned a slave, doesn't apply to me. The point isn't about just owning a slave or not owning a slave. The point is about how does the gospel, the theology spoken, the knowledge, the words, uh, the, the, the actual you know, systematized ideas about what we should or should not believe about Christ. How do those things make a real-world transformational difference in your life? How must you submit your life to those gospel principles? And I want to show you, it's not that there's only four, but I want to show you four of those as we look through this book today. So um, with that having been said, I, wanna, I want to read this um, here for us today. It says in verse 1, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, who we've mentioned, our dear friend and co-worker, to Aphia, our sister. Aphia is most likely Philemon's wife. To Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is his address to 
Philemon. I always thank my God when I mention you in my prayers because I hear of your love for all the saints and the faith that you have in the Lord Jesus. I pray that your participation in the faith may become effective through knowing every good thing that is in us for the glory of Christ. For I have great joy and encouragement from your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, brother. For this reason, although I have boldness in Christ to command you to do what is right, I appeal to you instead on the basis of love. I, Paul, as an elderly man and now also as a prisoner of Jesus Christ, appeal to you for my son Onesimus. I became his father while I was in chains. Once he was useless to you, but now he is useful both to you and to me. In the original language, the word Onesimus, the name means useful. He was once useless to you, but now he is useful both to you and to me. Verse 12, I am sending him back to you. I am sending my very own heart. I wanted to keep him with me so that in my imprisonment for the gospel, he might serve me in your place. But I didn't want to do anything without your consent so that your good deed might not be out of obligation, but of your own free will. For perhaps this is why he was separated from you for a brief time so that you might get him back permanently, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave. As a dearly loved brother, He is especially so to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So, if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would me. And if he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it, not to mention to you that you owe me even your very self. Yes, brother, may I benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Since I am confident of your obedience, I am writing to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. Meanwhile, also prepare a guest room for me since I hope that through your prayers I will be restored to you. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greetings. And so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my co-workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Of the four guides to gospel transformation, the first one is that Christ comes first. Christ comes first. Now, the reason I say this is because this, Paul starts out by talking to Philemon about, in him, a battle of competing identities. There is, in Uh, Philemon's life, in our lives, in everyone's lives. When you sign on to the faith, you place your faith in Christ, he is the Lord of your life, meaning Lord of your life means he gets to tell you who you are and what you do. And in obedience, we follow that God. When when, when we pray, when when Brother Brian is is doing prayer requests and he says we ask the Lord for for wisdom, uh, that means so that we'll know what he wants us to do and then we'll do it. In our lives, it is a battle of competing identities. When you place your faith in Christ, you have taken on a new identity in Christ, and that identity must reign supreme. And so it may be the case that at certain times in your life, you can have your identity in Christ and also uh, live uh, in light of another identity, whether it be also your work or something of that nature, and you may be able to hold those two in uh, conjunction until they come into conflict. And the problem is, uh, th- there's no problem, let's say, if you want to play sports and, and you say, I, I want to play sports, you can play sports and be an athlete and you can also be a Christian. But if, if the idea is, every single Sunday I cannot ever go to church because we have sports, well, now you have a conflict and you have to decide, in this example, it doesn't have to be that, but just as an easy example, which of your identities reigns supreme, which means when they come into conflict, which takes a backseat to the other. That's what Paul's talking to Philemon about. Philemon, when he sees Onesimus, he has the option to legally, under the local laws, he has a right to do certain things with and to Onesimus. But Paul is appealing to his identity in Christ, which 
should, if the gospel is transformative in your life, should supersede his rights under the law as a slave owner and as a business person. He can do certain things legally in the laws of the land, in the eyes of the local government, that he should not do under the laws of God. And that is what Paul is appealing to. And so if, for this reason, the first gospel, God, is that Christ comes first. Your identity in Christ is supreme to anything else. Now, uh, I see this here. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Uh, and this is uh, a reference, you know, talking about uh, America's, America's founding on, on Judeo-Christian values. You, uh, if, if many of you think back on your life, Perhaps, uh, and I think you would agree that this is true, you look back on your life and you go, when I was younger, the uh, laws of the land looked aligned more with maybe the laws of the church than they do now. Would you say that's a fair, a fair assessment, right? Now, here's the difficulty. In some ways, that is a privilege that we, uh, you know, probably less so in my life because I'm younger than, than maybe um, some of you. I, I, maybe it, they were not, <laughs> that was like a me. They, the things have changed really fast in my lifetime, I'll say. If you think about, however, let's say, you know, in the last hundred years, the last hundred years for us in the United States is an anomaly in Christian history, and I'll tell you why. The, in many ways, not, not entirely, but there was somewhat of a loose association between the laws of the land and things that uh, might be values in the church, whether that be things on marriage, or, you know, rights of the unborn, whatever the case may be. And you guys know what I'm talking about. Those, in the last hundred years, there was an alignment of those things, uh, you know, maybe not exactly, but somewhat loosely, right? And those things have grown fewer and fewer as time goes on, right? As we get to the modern day. If you go back farther, though, and you spread, remember, we're taking a journey back in time, every time we open the Bible, back in time and across to the Middle East. In church history, Seldom was it ever the case. In fact, until the United States, for the most part, it was never the case that any church ever lived under the uh, laws of a nation that in any way resembled the Christian faith at all. Like, like I grew up in the former Soviet Union. So when I was, so I spent 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th grade in this, essentially the Soviet Union. It's different. If you guys remember the old Iron Curtain and things like that, I grew up there. I know what it's like. I speak Russian, which is a useless thing to know in Middle Tennessee. It really is. I've seen churches who grew up, and I, I, I know pastors who spent a decade in prison, actual real life behind bars for the faith, and they didn't even complain about it. It was assumed, if you believe in Christ and you preach, you'll just go to jail. That's what happens. I have met Chinese believers who say, we don't even know if we trust a pastor who has never been to prison because we don't know if he's serious about it or not. I simply say that to say the period of time where it felt like there was a, an alliance, some kind of alignment between church values and the, the laws of the land in the United States, that is a massive anomaly in church history for Christians. Not saying it's a bad thing, saying it doesn't normally happen and very few churches ever in church history in the past, and m for the most part in other places in the world outside of where we are now, with my friends in, in Central Asia, my uh, friends in the Middle East, it's very different. And so one difficulty, although there were many amazing blessings that came out of that alignment between uh, uh, laws and, and, and church values. One of the difficulties is uh, when we were talking about competing identities, right, if we're talking about competing identities like Paul's talking about in Philemon, one of the difficulties is when the alignment is so close, we can defer or sometimes mix those uh, you know, your, your national identity with your Christian identity in a way that other Christians and other nations never did because there, it was never anything close to an alignment between values of the government and values of the church. So I'll give you an example of one of the difficulties that we now have as we are transitioning now to a government whose 
uh, the, the laws increasingly or, or decreasingly reflect anything resembling Christian values. I'll give you an example. Uh, back in the day, let's say 20, 30 years ago, if your teenager came to you and said, I want to smoke marijuana, what does the Bible say about this? Well, okay. For the most part, what we could say in the past was we are Christians and Christians don't, we're not rebellious, law-breaking anarchists. And the laws of the land say you cannot smoke marijuana. It is illegal. And we don't break the law. Okay. And that works until the laws of the land don't say that anymore. And we may have, unfortunately, in the past, deferred in our discipleship, in our training up of the next generation to live Christ-like lives and allow the gospel to transform our lives, we may have made the mistake of deferring that to the laws of the land because at the moment it worked. And then as soon as the laws change, it becomes more difficult. Now your kid can ask you the same question. Now my, my son could ask me the same question, and I cannot answer that way. It's not that it was wrong to do that perhaps in the past, but I simply say, as the, I say that to, to, to demonstrate, if we're talking about competing identities, which one reigns supreme? Because when they come into conflict, and now it, the, one, gen, uh, one generation to the next, the, the uh, you know, Christian and American identities weren't quite at odds the way that they are now, if that makes sense. Now, those are more at odds, and so now we have, to, we have to parse that out for ourselves and decide how does that play out. How do we decide which ones, uh, you know, where, they, where the things conflict and where Christ must reign supreme in uh, not just America, and I simply use that as an example, but whatever identities are, are at war in our lives for supremacy, how do we establish Christ's identity in us as ultimately supreme compared to everything else that we do. That is what Paul is asking Philemon to do here. He is asking him to put aside things that legally he is allowed to do and to operate in such a way that is honoring to Christ and what the gospel desires for disciples to do. And that is a competing identity at war in our lives, and it may be work things, it may be a national identity, it may, it could be a variety of things. It doesn't matter which one it is. It only matters that whatever identities are at play in your life, if it's husband, if it's father, if you're in the military, like whatever the case may be, whatever other identity is existing in your life, it's not that necessarily any other identities are bad per se, but they cannot supersede your identity in Christ, it must reign supreme. And that is what Paul is asking here of Philemon. Don't do things that legally you're allowed to do because they are not honoring and glorifying to the Lord as a disciple of Christ. In the past for us in the United States, that, those competing identities weren't as difficult as they are now. And that is how we have to uh, adapt and adjust as a church with the changing times is to say, how does the gospel transform our lives in those competing identities? And I see, um, I see the second thing I want to uh, point out here is not only that the Christ must come first in our identities. Secondly, our hearts, hearts must change. Our hearts must change. And I'll show you here. In verse 7, he says, For I... Have great joy and encouragement from your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, brother. Now, when I coached youth basketball, when they were teaching us how to coach, they said, if you're going to correct a player, you have to use what they call an encouragement sandwich. Meaning, you say a, a, an encouraging thing, and then you say a corrective thing, something that's maybe more negative, and then you follow it up with another encouraging thing. So you've got encouragement on either side of the correction. Paul literally does that here. He like starts off with a whole section. He's like, man, all the saints are telling me you got a lot of faith, a lot of love. That's refreshing. Don't treat Onesimus like a slave anymore. And also, he says at the end in, uh, in verse 20, uh, to follow it up, he says, yes, brother, may I benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. So it's like, refresh, 
don't treat them like a slave, refresh again. And it's like this encouragement sandwich. Now, what Paul does here in uh, verse uh, 8, in verse 8 he says this. In verse 8, he says, For this reason, although I have great boldness in Christ to command you, command you to do what is right, I appeal to you. I could command you, but I'm not going to. I appeal to you. Why would that matter? Why would that matter? Now, an interesting thing to consider is uh, maybe you know people in your life who are uh, Jewish. And, uh, you know, our society is largely built on Judeo-Christian you know, Western values, and in, in, in many ways on a societal level, those things are pretty similar. But when it comes down to the finer parts of theology, they're quite different. And one of the big differences is the Christian versus Jewish view of uh, the heart and the actions and how those are connected. So a Christian would say, you could do all the right things, but if you have the wrong heart, that they don't matter. You're doing them under false pretenses. Uh, if you give your tithes, but you do so begrudgingly and with you know, complaints and you're mad about it, that's not even the point. The point is to give it willingly. So in, in our view, the heart of how you do things makes the things you do have any meaning on a spiritual level, right? On a Jewish level, they do not think that. They think if you do the things first, the heart will follow. So if you are a person who is not happy and you would like to be happy, then it doesn't matter if your heart is, it, it doesn't feel like it's happy. You should do things that people who are happy do. And if you do those things long enough, eventually your heart will catch up. And it's not to say that's like a stupid thing in general. However, on a spiritual level, we know people who could, you could come to church, you could do all the church things, you could go to Sunday school, but your heart may not even be in the right place at all. And what was it all for? And so we believe in the Christian faith that the heart is the center of our desires and our will, and we have to submit our heart and our desires to Christ. And it's for this reason that Paul says, I don't command you even though I could. And if he did, Paul could essentially pull rank on him and say, you got to do this because I'm Paul. I started this church. I'm the most renowned Christian in the world. I've planted the most churches. I've converted the most Christians. He's also killed the most Christians. But he could pull rank on him, and Philemon would do it. Because you got to remember, uh, Middle Eastern culture is not like American culture. We have a guilt and innocence culture, meaning you're judged. You're not judged on the sins of your father. You're judged on your own merit. That's not true in the Middle East. You are judged for the sins of your father and the sins of all the people that you associate with, guilt by association. That is how the Middle East works. And so if Paul were to ask Philemon to do this, it would be horrifically shameful to the church and everyone associated if Philemon disobeys a direct command from Paul. Philemon would do it, but Paul doesn't want him to just do it. Paul wants him to want to do it because there's a difference, because his heart is in the right place. Hearts must change. We have to be doing the correct things for the correct reasons in order for them to matter because we don't want to live our whole lives going through the motions and yet the, be hollow on the inside. Thirdly, we've said Christ must come first. We've said hearts must, must change. Thirdly, families can reconcile. And this is something I find uh, so interesting. Tradition tells us that Philemon and Onesimus, they did reconcile, and Philemon followed Paul's request. We don't know in the scriptures if that happened or not. It would be cool if it was like in the book of Acts somewhere, but it's not. It would make sense to me that Philemon did what Paul requested. Now, Paul and Barnabas, this is, this is where we, we see this uh, importance of reconciliation here that families can reconcile. And, and I have found it to be the case that uh, in the churches that I have pastored, in the three churches I've been a part of, the, one of the biggest difficulties that faithful believers have is when they have unbelieving children. It is a heavy burden on their hearts and their lives. And I have seen it be the case time over time that the Lord, until the final day that 
that uh, that person you know, leaves this earth and draws their last breath, that it is still possible for those families to reconcile and for them to come to faith in Christ. Now, Paul and Barnabas, I mentioned, are these, this dynamic duo, they're the first church planning team. They're going all around, planting churches, crazy conversions, the Lord is working, things are going great. And along the way, they pick up an apprentice. And this dude's name is John Mark. John Mark, is he's great. He's fantastic. He's all in. He's bought into the ministry. He's helping them plant churches. They're seeing people saved. Everything's going great. And then they wake up one morning, and John Mark just left. He completely abandoned them. He had all these responsibilities in the ministry, and he left Paul and Barnabas high and dry. He, he totally abandoned them in the ministry, and he just went home to mom. That's what he did. Paul and Barnabas finish out their journey. It goes great. They plant more churches, see more people saved. And they're at home, they're at this church in, in Antioch, and they're taking some time off, and all of a sudden Barnabas comes to Paul again. And he's like, hey, man, that went really well last time. Paul's like, yeah, it did. This is, my, uh, this is the, 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 the new Carson translation of how. This is my, uh, my, my pastor called it the sanctified imagination. Paul, things went great last time. Yeah, they did, man. Let's do it again, round two. Yeah, that's great. And he's like, uh, Barnabas is like, yeah, it's, it's me. And Paul's like, yep, you. And it's Paul. And Paul's like, yep, me. And he's like, and it's John Mark. And Paul's like, what? John Mark? Why, why in the world would we ever take John? John Mark totally abandoned us. He's the worst. Why would we ever take him anywhere again? Why would we trust him? With some, like, this is, like, there are either gonna be, there's either going to be a church in the lost and dying world or not based on if we succeed at this. And John Mark abandoned us and all his responsibilities in that mission. Why would we ever take him again? And they went back and forth, and the original language uses the, not just the, the regular word for debate, but it was that they came to such a sharp and strong, fiery disagreement that they broke up. Like the first, they're like best friends who've been through all kind of craziness together. And they broke up because of a disagreement on this one guy, John Mark. So Barnabas and John Mark go do their thing, and Paul gets another guy, uh, him and Silas and, and Timothy. He picks up another dude named Timothy, and they go do their thing. And Paul continues on, right? And so then as his life goes by, he's writing this letter. And what's interesting is he's writing this letter, and he finishes. If you flip to the very back, in verse 23, he's, he's finishing the letter, so you know you're signing your name, and he looks around the room, and he's like signing you know, for everybody else. He's like, hey, all these people send you. Greetings, and he looks around, and he's like, uh, okay, Epaphras is here, and uh, uh, Demas is here, and Aristarchus is here, and John Mark is here. Now, that is so interesting to me, because John Mark caused significant damage to Paul's ministry over the years. And yet, at the end of his life, in a very vulnerable time, where he didn't know if he was going to die or not, John Mark is right there. Now, this guy goes on to becoming, it is widely believed that he's the one who wrote the gospel of Mark as well. This dude is a big deal in the Christian world, and it wouldn't have had to be that way. Paul could have chosen to say, hey, man, you left us high and dry. You're done. But he didn't. He reconciled. And we don't have an account of how this happened or when this happened or how long Mark had been with Paul. We don't know. But what we do know is that he reconciled. And so why does that matter? Well, it matters because Philemon and Onesimus need to reconcile. And Paul, like a good pastor and a good leader, is not asking Philemon to do something hypothetical but Paul would never do. And nobody likes taking directions from somebody who you're like, you don't even know what it's like. Like, you, you never been there. How would you know? He is asking Philemon to do something with Onesimus that he himself had already done with John Mark. Families can reconcile. And the leaders must uh, be willing, the leaders of a church, of a congregation, of a family, must be willing to do the things that they are asking others to do as well. And so fourthly, 
Not only Christ comes first, secondly, hearts, hearts must change. Thirdly, families can reconcile. And fourthly, leaders shape the culture. Leaders shape the culture of your church. That is the way that it works. It's very hard to, if you've ever had, you know, like my first job, I was uh, detailing cars at a car dealership. It was like the worst thing I've ever done in my life. I don't know why I did it. It was like an hour, almost an hour away from my house one way, and I was making $12 an hour. So I was like, I was in the hole by the time I showed up to work because of gas, basically. And I just had the worst boss ever. I, I couldn't stand it. And for whatever reason, I don't know, maybe you guys have done this. You just stay in a job, and you're like, why am I here? I don't even know. I could get another job. I just, I don't know. I'm just stuck. And I have the worst boss. And you... You eventually get out of that, and you start to work somewhere or for someone who's a great guy, and it's a great culture. Like, oh, my goodness. It, you mean, like, working doesn't have to be depressively miserable and horrific every day? Like, th it, there's hope in life? Like, your whole outlook is totally different, and that starts with whoever is leading, whoever is in charge. The same is, it, it could be a business. It could be a nonprofit. It could be a church. It doesn't matter. That is true regardless of where you are. And we see this from Paul. So if you read any of Paul's other letters, they are heavily theological, especially Romans, premier among them, but also Galatians as well. And in Galatians 4, 28, Paul has written, like a very famous thing Paul wrote in Galatians 4, 28, he says, there is no longer Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female, since all are one in Christ. Theology. That's head knowledge, that's hypothetically, this is, this is the thing we should believe, and hypothetically we should apply this to uh, applicable situations in our lives. And then he writes the book of Philemon, and he has in his mind, no more slave or free. It's just everybody's one in Christ. And then in Philemon, he basically says the same thing. He basically says that in verses uh, 15 and 16, he writes to Philemon, and he appeals to him, and he says, For perhaps this is why he was separated from you for a brief time, so that you might get him back permanently, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, as a dearly loved brother. He is especially so to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. No more slave or free. Everybody is one in Christ. He is taking theology that he wrote and is he, he is applying it practically to situations that he is in and asking a person to not act in ways that are legally permissible, which he could have done and been totally fine in the, the eyes of the law. He is asking him to appeal to the supreme identity in his life to live in light of the gospel that, number one, comes from Christ, and number two, Paul taught him himself in person in his home. To appeal to that and say, live according to this, and the way you do that transformationally is to act in a way that is not legally mandated, like you might say, I can't smoke weed because it's against the law. It's not legally mandated for you to act this way, but Christ is asking you in light of your identity in him to treat one another in this way, in this circumstance, and I appeal to you, I don't force you even though I could. And he kind of throws his weight around a little bit. He said, like, let's not even mention the fact that you owe me your whole life. And then Paul, and then Paul even gives him a reminder of the gospel, like a little tiny, it's like a tiny object lesson of the Bible. He's really doing it and offering it. But he says, if Onesimus owes you anything at all, charge it to my account and I will pay it. And that's the gospel. That's what hap that's what Christ says to the Father. He says, uh, whatever this person's name is, Carson Outlaw, if, when, when I stand before the Father, Jesus, the Son, looks at the Father and says, if he owes anything, charge it to my account, and I will pay it. He already paid it. And that's what Paul is doing on a small level for Onesimus. And so you can imagine, you know, there's no, uh, there's no printing presses, there's no email. How, how do these letters get delivered? Someone brings them, and they stand in front of the whole church, and, you know, hear ye, hear ye, this is what Paul said. 
And the first thing he reads is he's like, hey, guys, it's me, Paul, just, you know, to you guys. And then he's like, calls out Philemon immediately. And you can imagine, you know, like when the microphones go out and everybody, like, looks at the AV guy, like, in the, in the tech booth, you know? That's how it was, you know? It's like, hey, Philemon, man, don't do it. And everybody's like, what is Philemon going to do about this? It would have been very difficult for Philemon to not follow Paul's request. I don't doubt for a second that he, he did. But he must have had his heart in the right place. And he must have been, Paul, Paul clearly reminds him of the gospel and asks him to allow it to transform him in ways that legally he was allowed to act, but in ways that were not in alignment with what the gospel required. That is as practical as, of an application of a story for us today or anybody at any future time. That is practical and applicable because any of us, it doesn't matter the specifics, slave, not slave, house, church, whatever, it doesn't matter. You've got competing identities in your life and one of them has to reign supreme. And for disciples of Christ, you are in Christ, meaning every other identity, when it comes into conflict with something you believe in Christ, it has to submit itself to Christ. And that you don't just go through the motions. Your heart has to be in the right place or the motions. You might as well not even waste your time because they don't mean the right things anyway. And if you need to reconcile with somebody, you can go to that person and do it because the leaders have done it before. Paul has done it before. And and, and whatever it is that's between the two of you on an eternal scale is nothing. Most of the time we're mad at people for stuff. We can't even remember why we're mad. Why were the Hatfields and McCoys fighting for so long? They don't even know. You just get get angry or emotional, but you need to reconcile because in the light of eternity, and Christians are always thinking about it, in the light of eternity, whatever problems you might have with a particular person are minuscule in light of what Christ has done. And, and, And it starts from the top. It starts from the top. That's why false doctrines... You know, having correct theology matters because if you're supposed to build your life based on those uh, biblical principles, if you got the wrong principles, it's likely you'll end up living incorrectly. And we want to avoid that as much as possible. We want to avoid that. And so it starts from the top down. And that's why having, that's why when, uh, you know, the, the book before Philemon, Titus, there's a long list of all the things that you are required to be in order to lead a church. You can't be angry. You can't be caught up in selfish ambition. You can't be a drunkard. You can't be violent. You have to con- con- uh, have control over your own house. You have to be a man of one wife. Like, it seems, it's like, that's a lot of stuff. Why does that matter? Because it starts from the top down. That's why it matters. The specifics are different from Philemon and the ancient world and the Middle East thousands of years ago than they are now. But the practical principles are exactly the same. And so I encourage you, whatever the case may be, whatever situations may be at play in your life, I I encourage you through this book to remember that the gospel is not compartmentalized to a couple hours on one day of the week. And then once you leave through those doors and go back out into the world, whatever other identities in your life are at play, those are those are back in shape. Maybe you won't do it, do certain things in the church building, but once you get outside, it's, it's fair game. I just encourage you not to live like this. Not to do things just because the law might allow you to do them, but to live your life in a way where you could look the Lord in the face and justify how you've been living. And that, that's a scary thing to consider doing. And so I ask you to remember those points, and to remember how Paul has requested Philemon to change his life and that you in your life, with whatever specifics it might be, with whatever situations you might face, that you would ask the Lord to guide you to allow the gospel and its principles to transform every area of your life. He gets it, all access, the whole house. You don't get to keep any dirty hidden closets where you stow all your skeletons away. It's everything. There's no basements that's dark and you never shine a light because it's too dirty and we don't go in there. It's everything. He gets everything. And he sees it. And it's not like he doesn't know already. 
He already knows what's down there and what's in the, behind closed doors. He sees it all and he knows it all. He's just waiting for you to give it to him. And my prayer for you today is that you would give it to him, that you would allow him to seep into those areas of your heart in your life, that you would dedicate your life and your family to, to him and living a life worthy of him and honoring to the God that we serve. Heavenly Father, we come before you today and we just are grateful for your word as you guide us through it, that you've given us timeless principles stored up in, in here that the specifics may change over time, but the, the principles are eternal. And we're grateful that as our lives you know, the difficult circumstances that all of us will face and are facing at this time in our lives, that you have given us guides in your word that are always available to us and always applicable to our lives, whatever the specifics may be. And Lord, we are grateful for that. And we ask that we would have the courage and the boldness to look to your word as a guide and the courage to also live our lives in accordance with what we find in the scriptures, and we pray these things in the name of Jesus, amen. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together with cords that cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together. Thank you, Brother Carson, for coming to preach. Um, I think Brian's going to say a few things. Thank you so much for that uh, message. I really enjoyed that. So um, we're going to have a, a prayer, ending prayer, and then for those of you that are members, if you would hang around, we'll immediately uh, begin our business meeting right after that. Um, so let's let's give it about two or three minutes, and then and then we'll meet back in here right here. Okay. All right. So um, did you have something, Keith? Yeah, Brother Carson, if you'd like to add on that. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Chris Parker, if you wouldn't mind, to close this and ask for wisdom for our business meeting that's still there.
Okay, thank you. All right, for those of you